Hey there, my name is Pastor Preston. I'm the creative pastor here at Generation Church, and I'm so glad that you found this message today. Uh, however you made your way here, I hope that it's exactly what you need for this moment and this time that you're walking through right now in your life. Uh, I believe that anytime God's Word intersects our lives, it's powerful enough to make a difference. And so that's what I hope that this message does for you today. Uh, this series that we're in right now is called Bread and Circuses. So, hey, we have a value here that we say we will lean in, which means that anytime we listen to the Word of God, we're going to lean in, we're going to listen, we're going to write down and take notes and things that we can come back to. So grab your Bible, your notebook, your pen, and get ready for this message. And especially when you take into consideration, I think one of the things that I try to always teach my kids and even when I try to teach the Bible is like, Let's not just read a verse and go on or, you know, make a verse fit what we're trying to talk about. Let's really talk about, let's, let's have some context to what we're talking about. And Jesus makes a bold proclamation about building something that nobody can destroy. And it's, it's odd that he does this because you got to remember the time of history in which Jesus walked the earth. He walked the earth in the middle of what was known as the uh, Roman Empire that ruled the modern world during that day. Now remember, Rome was known for building the first road systems. It's amazing, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, and how God is a, is a God of timing. Even when we don't think he's on time for us, he's always a God of timing. And I heard somebody ask like, why did Jesus walk in that day? Like why did he come to the earth in that day and not sooner? But this was a time in history where, number one, there was an empire that ruled the world, but they actually paved roads that they thought was going to lead, all roads lead to Rome, but they were actually building roads in which the apostles and new believers would carry the gospel throughout the world. How powerful is that? And uh, so Jesus is walking to the Roman Empire. Remember, everyone thought that Rome would last forever. I mean, Rome was the big dogs. Nobody's going to take down Rome. And Jesus makes this pretty controversial statement to say, I'm building something that even Rome isn't going to outlast. And how many of you know that would have been like heresy in that day? The thing about Rome is that Rome would eventually fall, like almost every great nation that's ever existed, by the way. It's almost like history continues to repeat itself over and over and over again. But did you know something interesting about Rome is that Rome, and maybe you've watched all the cool movies, you've watched Gladiator, you know, if you haven't, you're not saved, but like if you watch Gladiator or anything to do with Rome, you think about Caesar, you think about the empire, you think about all these different Gladiator games. But here's what's interesting about Rome is that Rome for 300 years was actually a democratic republic. That means the people had a say so, they voted, they did, you know, kind of like the democracy that we have today. And it wasn't until 31 BC that they became an empire. And if you've ever wondered, like, how in the world did they go from people having a say so and a right to, to vote and, and talk about what they, what they want to where now the empire is ruled by an emperor who, by the way, is not only a dictator, but also calls himself God and requires you to worship him. Because that's where they went. And how many of you know it didn't happen overnight? And it's interesting because there was this slow process that began to happen throughout the nation. And a, and a Roman writer or journalist actually wrote about this in 100 AD, about 150 to 70 years after the Democratic Republic turned into an empire. And his name was Juvenal. And he wrote about something called Panem et Circenses, which is simply Latin for bread and circuses. And here's the quote that he writes. It says, for the people who once upon a time handed out military command, high civil office, legions, everything, now restrains itself and anxiously hopes for just two things, bread and circuses. What the emperor knew was that he could convince the people to slowly forget their values, their beliefs, and even surrender to whatever he wanted to do as long as he kept them fed and kept them entertained. And so the empire would hand out free grain to everyone. 
And then they had about 150 days out of the year where they would have gladiator games. They would have all these contests, juggling contests. I'm like, they gave up their rights for juggling? But how many of you know, our culture is not very different. We, I almost called this series Netflix and chill, but I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> not trying to end up on Portland hip, you know what I'm saying? Or <laughs> hip Portland, whatever. But because we do, we live in such a society and culture. And, and listen, I'm not just talking about the world culture, I'm talking about church culture. Because some of you are the same in church as the rest of the world. In other words, all you care about is getting fed and being entertained. That's why some of you grew up and half of your life has been spent going to church instead of being in the church. I've been gone for two months. I may come stomping in the door today, okay? <laughs> Y'all may be like, hey, can you take two more months off? We don't need, <laughs> you're a little abrasive today, okay? Uh, no, I watched this summer. I saw what some people said. But anyways, <laughs> but how many of you know that over time, we have lost our own value system. And don't get it twisted, this is not a sermon about America, this is a sermon about us as believers. Because this whole series is gonna be about godly values, biblical values, and here's what I want you to understand. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you can like let what I'm saying go in through in one ear and out the other. You don't have to listen, because this doesn't apply to you. What I would encourage you to do is ask yourself a question, does this stuff make sense as we talk about it over the coming weeks? Because number one, if you're not a believer or you're wrestling with this whole thing, I'm so glad you're here because that's why we started this church. This church wasn't started so that we could have Christian conversations and then ignore everybody on the outside. This is, we're here today so that we can get, the, get filled up with the power of the Holy Spirit so we can go out there and make a difference in our jobs and our schools and everywhere else. The problem is we live in a culture that says our four and no more, as long as we're in our walls. Jesus makes an interesting statement. And it's a statement that has actually been misinterpreted for years. He says, I'm going to build my church. Now, does anybody know what that original Greek word church actually was that Jesus said? Ecclesia. Now, why is that important? Because over the years, and I actually preached a whole sermon series on this. When they were translating the Bible to English, um, a lot of them did not want to disrupt the temple worship that was still going on. This is why if you grew up in a very religious environment, you were taught when you walk into the house of the Lord, you respect the house because this is where God's spirit dwells. But that's not true to the new covenant. The new covenant says now you are the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit now dwells in you. But religious people want a temple to worship and a man to tell them what to do and how to live instead of understanding that the Holy Spirit has empowered all of you to actually live out this. The Bible says that God created, he actually established me as a leader and a pastor to equip you to do ministry. But you grew up in churches that probably said, we pay the pastor to do all the work. That's a whole nother sermon, Gaines. I gotta stop. I'm gonna preach everything I got that I've learned in two months in five minutes. So this is important because they translate that word ecclesia to actually a German word called kirche or church because they didn't want people to stop respecting at the time, I'm not bashing Catholics, but they didn't want people to lose their reverence for the Catholic church or the temple in which they would come and worship. And so they thought we need to change this to kirche or church because we want people to understand that this is what, can I tell you, but here's what Jesus was saying. I'm not building, ecclesia means gathered ones or called out ones. He says, I'm not building a building, I'm building a people. I'm building a following. And these gathered ones, listen, can I tell you, it's pretty amazing that he said this thousands of years ago and hello, here we are still today. In fact, do you realize that when you read through the Bible that all the cities and nations mentioned, Israel is still the only nation that exists today as it did in the Bible? You can't tell me that God, God ain't true for thousands of years that his words still don't be relevant for today. And so he says, I'm building something that even hell itself won't come against. And so he establishes these values. But can I tell you that they say that the number one thing that killed Rome was comfort. That's what killed it. It led to its demise. And it didn't happen overnight, Mitch. It happened slowly 
over the years as people relinquished what they really valued and cared about so that they could be fed and entertained. And that's where most of us are. Here's what I want you to know. Everything rises and falls on leadership, but leadership rises and falls on values. In fact, you could say this, that most people's values will be revealed in two arenas. One, your values will always be revealed in times of crisis or tension. Anytime there's a tension, your values will be coming to the surface. Every single one of us grew up in some sort of family value system, whether it was intentional or unintentional. You had a value system you grew up with. Now, in 1715, the age of enlightenment hit in, in our society, in our culture. Now, let's, let's talk about the three values that entered into our society, and let's ask ourselves, is this still true today? The first value that entered society was the pursuit of happiness. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about happiness as you know it. I'm talking about pleasure. In other words, whatever pleases you, pursue that. That was a value that came to the surface. Hey, we want to pursue whatever it is that pleases you. You go do that. The second value that kind of arose to the surface was a rejection of all authority. That, that you, you, but listen, you don't submit to any authority. You don't respect authority. And the third value that came to the forefront was this unrestricted freedom of choice. Now, I don't know about you, I'm grateful that we live in a free nation. Are you guys grateful? I'm grateful for those who fight for our freedoms, all that stuff. But freedom without responsibility is chaos. And freedom without boundaries is chaos and leads to anarchy. Now, can we say that was in 1715? Are any of those values still alive today in our current culture? We see it now more than ever, don't we? People want unrestricted freedoms. People don't respect authority. And people are pursuing whatever it is that makes them feel good, pleasure. And all of you grew up in some sort of family value system. Again, whether it was handed down purposely or not, you grew up with a system. And, and, and so for a lot of us, it looked like this, especially in my culture. I grew up, I'm a Gen X. Anybody Generation X? That's the greatest generation, right? Um, money. Social status, family was the values. Now, don't, don't miss this. I'm not saying you had money. I'm saying that was the goal, that you value getting money because money was security. If I have security, I have status. And as long as I have money and status, my kids will be okay. But can I tell you what this value system leads to every single time? Dysfunction. Because what you ended up with is homes where dads worked nonstop and were never around. And the key was to get more stuff because if you had more stuff, then you were happy and you thought, man, okay, now my kids are gonna have something. You don't realize that what your kids needed was not your stuff, but they needed you. And that's why, and I'm gonna talk about this, especially next week. That's why we have such a broken value system in our family today um, because most of, especially men in our culture, dads aren't even, they're not even respected in our culture now because most of them are absentee. And so the thought process was, man, if I have money and I have status, my kids are gonna be taken care of. That was what we valued. And so for a lot of us, we walk through this dysfunction. And what you gotta know is, do you know what your family value system is? Because your value system will always come to the surface when crisis hits. That's why when you're tested at work, with something that's, um, that it has to do with your integrity or it has to do with making a decision that's hard, that in that moment will reveal your values. When you're at school and you're struggling with, do I cheat or do I get an F on this because I didn't prepare? That's when your value system will be revealed. Your values are not what you say that they are, it's how you live. Because your values should direct your behavior. So, if, so that means if you don't have values or don't know what they are, how many of you know your behavior just goes with the flow? It's whatever you're feeling in that moment because now you have nothing that's directing your behavior. Are y'all with me this morning? And so for us, for me and my family, we said, listen, our, our values are simple. It's gonna be God and family because here's what we believe. 
if we have God's blessing, our kids are gonna be taken care of. It's a difference. And some of you have it twisted, you have it backwards because you're like, if I have money and stuff, oh, and then we have church, then we're good. And that's how some of us grew up in the, in the good old South, especially because we have a lot of good old boys that just church is just something you went to, but it wasn't something that set a root and a value system in your life that said, this is how we determine how we behave. We're gonna always be honest. We're gonna always have integrity. We're gonna always have character. Why? Because it's a value system that we built. I tell people like our family's not perfect, but let me tell you what we are, we're persistent. Can I tell you what my goal is as a parent? My goal is to make sure that my kids grow up not having to recover from me. Because let me tell you something, I love my mama, my daddy, like they did the best that they could. I've forgiven them for all the dysfunction in the past. But let me tell you something, I spent half of my young adult life trying to overcome, trying to detox from dysfunction. Anybody ever had to try to detox from dysfunction? And I don't want my kids to have to detox from me. That's my goal as a parent. But a lot of people you have not established, let me tell you something, your behavior will always let people know what you value, always. That's why some people, man, they've worked hard to get the boat, to get the truck, to get the house, and you got all those things yet lost your family. I just believe that, man, my kids, as long as we have the blessing of God on our lives, they're gonna be fine, amen? Because here's the thing. I believe that if we have the blessing of God, they'll never lack. They may not always like what they get, but they'll never lack. That's some of y'all's problem. Y'all care more about what they, what they like. They used to like to eat their boogers too. You trust that logic? <laughs> when you trust them to establish the values, it gets messed up. But all of us, that's why like you grew up, have you ever told yourself like, man, I'm not gonna be like my dad, I'm not gonna be like my mom. And all of a sudden you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you're like, I'm my dad in pants, like here I am, it's me. I just said something like my father did, I just did some. Why, because if your values aren't chosen with purpose, they just get passed down. By watching your behavior. Dads, your kids are learning the value of church and everything else watching you. Are you just a, I'm gonna dress up, show up and go home every week? That's how they'll grow up viewing their faith. You dress up, you show up, you go home. That's not faith. That's not a relationship with Christ. That's religion. Are y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Kids are very observant, aren't they? You ever just been like, man, why won't you talk to me? Probably because you spent 13 years not talking to them. Is it, oh, it's getting quiet now. Y'all, I've been gone for two months. Y'all gonna do me like that? And now you want to talk about deep things because now all of a sudden you care about their adult life. But can I tell you the most influential years of their life is from eight to 11. And so for us, like, I mean, our kids are so observant. We we went to Charlotte this summer. I told my wife I wasn't going to tell the story again, but I'm doing it. (laughs) Went to Charlotte this summer. We went to this burger place and they had all this stuff. Listen, my son, he's six years old and he's a, he's a pretty good reader. So like everywhere he goes, he's trying to read signs. He's reading stuff. Sometimes that gets you in trouble, you know what I'm saying? And so like we have to take closed caption and off stuff, you know what I mean? But like we go to this restaurant and uh, it's, a, it's a burger place and on the wall and we see him, he's like, pistols, pistols. And it was like the band uh, poster, the sex pistols. And we're like, oh my gosh, he's reading that sign. Like, stop, stop, stop. Now remember my, my wife grew up like she, she was born in the Sunday school room. Like I'm pretty sure my mother-in-law was teaching Sunday school, gave birth and then finished her lesson. Cause number one, my mother-in-law is that tough. And number two, she's that holy. Like I just like, that's, that's her. So Jess is just like, you know, she hears a wordy dirt, you know, it's like it turns pale, you know? So we go into this place and I'm just like, you know, I, I mean, I grew up, I, you can take the, you can take me out of the hood, can you get the hood out of me sometimes, you know what I mean? And so we go and, and, and we're there and she's like, hey, she asked the waitress, so what's your, what's your most top selling burger here? Oh, that's easy. It's the bad, it's the bad AWS burger, you know? And she's like, just go, she says this word like six times and our kids are sitting there and I'm just, I'm laughing because I'm watching my wife like literally <laughs> die on the inside, Right? And all I kept expecting was true to be like, I'll take the bad AWS burger. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> why? Because they, they're, what? they're sponges. 
And so if we're not intentionally handing them values, they just get passed down by watching how you live your life. And so you gotta decide like, what are my family values? What is it that we truly value? Not what we say we value. What is it I have to look down deep inside and say, what does my behavior tell our kids that we value the most? Is it our marriage? Is it God? I, I was just talking with somebody the other day and man, it's, my heart breaks because one of our, our, our big vision for this church is to resurrect family trees. And I talked to so many couples, you ask them, how are you doing? We're doing good, we're doing good. And then I asked him a second question and we'll dive into this deeper next week. I'll say, but how are you guys like pursuing each other intimately? And then it gets awkward. Well, uh, eh. and I find out real quick that when their kids leave the house, it's like they're starting over. Because how many know when kids show up on the scene, they interrupt everything, right? They interrupt life. And some couples will grow apart because they didn't value the marriage. Are you guys with me? We'll talk about that one next week. But here's the question I want you to wrestle with is how do we build a foundational family value system that experiences God's enduring blessing. Because I don't know about you, but I want God's enduring blessing on my life and the life of my kids. So right value systems lead to enduring blessings. Now I wanna go to our main text in Matthew chapter seven, just a few chapters before this. Matthew chapter seven. Jesus is finishing up one of his most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And he spends an entire three or four chapters diving into this life of somebody who has experienced the kingdom. Not culture, but kingdom. And he says this in verse 24 to kind of wrap things up in this sermon. This is how he finishes the sermon. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, everyone say follows, follows. is wise. Like a person who builds a house on what? Solid rock. And here we go, you ready? Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise. How many of you know that's a picture of all hell breaking loose from above and from below? And how many of you know in the last year, year and a half, it's felt like it's come from all sides. Yes. And he says this, he says, and winds beat against that house, it won't, collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat anything. He doesn't say, when you come to me, you'll never get sick, you'll have all that you want. What in fact does he say? He says, you better build your house on what I'm teaching because if you don't, I'm telling you, hell's coming on this earth and you're going to have trouble. The famous prophet, Travis Tripp, once said, T-R-O-U-B-L-E. I think he might've been talking about something else, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> how many of you know trouble is coming? If you're not in a storm now, you either just got through one or one is on the horizon. Why? Because it's the world, the broken world that we live in. He doesn't sugarcoat it. And so there's a few things that I want you to get from this text. One is wise builders build for worst case scenarios. Not the best case, worst case. That's why if you build your marriage around the idea of happily ever after and the fairy tales, you're gonna be disappointed. You know how the frog turned into the prince? Reality's the other way around, right? Eventually we shrivel up and turn into frogs, right? <laughs> I gotta move on. Anyways, your house is only as strong as the foundation, right? I, I kid you not, this is, this is crazy. I, I read this story, I found, as I was studying for this sermon, I found this story and it was, it was mind blowing, but it's kind of come back to the surface because of the incident that happened in Florida this year with the condos that collapsed. But anybody ever heard of the Millennial Tower? 
It's in San Francisco. It's 400 multi-million dollar condos, largest condo system built in San Francisco. I mean, like the Hall of Famer quarterback, Joe Montana bought one when it first came out. 2009 was when it was built. They're like $5 million a condo. I mean, they have their own pool, their own theater. Like you never have to leave this place. Like it's, it's the ultimate home of homes in San Francisco. Here's the problem. They found out that it's sinking and tilting. So check out this story. This was in CBS News. Guys, I can't make this stuff up. Y'all tell me that the Bible's old-fashioned. It's not relative. Look at this article from CBS. The Millennium's, this is a quote in, in the article. The Millennium's current engineer, Ronald Hamburger, there's a problem right there. <laughs> they got the freaking hamburger. They're building their <laughs> condo system. So listen. <laughs> Y'all pay attention told CNN the building has now sunk and tilted 18 inches. Now check this out, y'all. Like, this, is, this is funny. After years of lawsuits, hearings, and finger pointing, a retrofit announced last October will anchor the building to bedrock, which to the derision of critics had not been done originally. Listen, I can't make this up. You ready? Instead, the foundation was built into deep sand. Experts determined that adjacent projects and a process called dewatering has weakened the soil under the tower, causing it to sink. Now, most of them can't even sell their condos. They say you can take a marble, roll it across the floor, and it'll roll back across the floor. They can't even sell them. $5 million. They're spending $400 million to correct the issue that they could have done when they built the foundation. Let me preach to you for a second. How many of you are paying the ultimate price because you failed to build the right foundation in the first place? Some of you, your, your middle age years will be more expensive than your teenage years because you built on the wrong foundation. And that's why you're trying to now reconcile a relationship with your children. Now you're trying to deal with your third marriage and you're hoping it hangs on. Am I preaching today? Yes. And I'm telling you, especially you guys on the front row, you need to make a decision now what you're going to build your life upon. Because when you build it on sand, I'm telling you, it will collapse every single time. I love the story of a man who was building a drainage ditch on his property and he went to his dad. He said, dad, how big should I build this drainage ditch according to the size of our property and according to the annual rainfall? And he said, son, you never build a drainage ditch according to the rain, you build it expecting floods. Wise builders build for the worst case scenario because when you understand that life is going to be hard and you build on the foundation of the rock, that's why when all hell breaks loose, you can say, God, God's got this because I have his enduring blessing and my security is not found in my money or the business that I built or how much stuff I have, but it's built on what God says and we're gonna obey what he says. <clears throat> Check this out. Wise builders build on God's word. Jesus promised the safety and security for those who build on his word. Here's the problem that we face is that we don't live in an anti, or, or excuse me, we don't, we don't live in a, in a non-biblical world, but we face an anti-biblical world. That's the problem. It's not non-biblical, it's anti-biblical. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why would anybody build on sand? That's easy. Three reasons. One, it's popular, right? It's popular to build on sand. It's popular to go with the culture. I mean, it's comfortable. I mean, some of y'all spent thousands of dollars to go put your feet in it this summer, right? There's a reason why when you go to the beach, you're not going, oh, look, rock cliffs. Let's go lay on those. The sand is comfortable. But here's the one that got me, Alan. Sand is conformable. You see, when you lay in the sand, it conforms to you. But when you lay on the rock, you conform to it. And Jesus is like, I'm not conforming to you and your culture. If you want to follow me, you're going to have to conform to me and my word. Because culture is always shifting, isn't it? 
I remember when they used to say this and now they say this and like it changes every other day. That's why I don't understand why you guys follow everything, what they say. I, listen, the greatest thing I did this summer was I got off social media, didn't watch one bit of news. Like I came back this week and I'm like, is everything okay? Because I don't know. If it's not, don't tell me. Like I've been, I've been great. I've been at peace this summer. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so like uh, when we build on the rock, can I tell you that the culture is constantly shifting. Remember they were like, hey, milk does the body good. Drink milk. Now they're like, stop drinking milk, it's killing you. And then they're like, remember the incredible edible egg? Eat the eggs, eggs are so good. Stop eating the eggs, just eat the whites, just eat the yolks, stop eating the yolks. I'm like, just, just, eat, just eat the egg, I don't know. <laughs> what are we doing, right? I can remember being a kid, anybody remember this? I remember being a kid, of course back then, I rode in a car in the floorboard, but like, <laughs> I can remember commercials glamorizing smoking. Anybody remember that? I thought, man, Joe Camel is a cool dude. <laughs> I can't wait. My grandma could like say, she could talk a full sentence with cigarette side of her mouth and not even like, <laughs> not even bat an eye. She could yell at, yell at us grandkids with a cigarette in her mouth. It was awesome. I was like, I can't wait to do that. <laughs> I always tell people one of my stepdads was the Marlboro man. Like, I mean, I'm just like, <laughs> mom had all the Marlboro points. You know what I'm talking about? You might know, am I, am I being real this morning? <laughs> Stop looking at me like y'all are holier than I am. <laughs> Golly. Some of y'all are itching to get out right now, smoke one. But anyway, he's like, listen. <laughs> like, I hope he's almost done. <laughs> <laughs> but now, right? Like now every commercial, like smoke is going to kill you. It's like, what are we doing? Like, I don't know. Culture has no anchor. It's always shifting. It's always shifting. So I'm gonna give you quick four things to begin building your family value system on. If you're a believer, and the first one is God's word. I know it sounds cliche-ish, but I'm telling you, ask yourself this question, are you ready? Does Jesus and his word have the ultimate authority in your life? I wanna sit in that for a second. Because some of you, you claim that you're a Christ follower, you claim that you're a Christian, but you never read God's word, you never study God's word, and you sure don't seek it when you gotta make important decisions. I talked to so many families that came to this church and they're like, yeah, we're moving. Oh, where are you moving? Well, you know, I got a better job offer or we're moving here because it's prettier here, it's this and that. They make every decision based off of comfort instead of is this gonna be the best move for my family spiritually? Because if we're honest with ourselves, most of our decisions are made out of a carnal value instead of a spiritual value. Oh, is this the most important move? The challenge I have to this church, and listen, you don't have to take it, it's fine. Like I'm just, I'm just giving a challenge. Those of you that will take it, will take it. Those of you that won't, won't. But I wanna challenge you to bring a physical Bible with you next week and start bringing it every week. If you don't have one, talk to somebody in the orange room. We're, we're talking about trying to make sure we can try to get some Bibles to give to people. And I get it. We live in a technology society, but can I tell you like that is ruining, ruining us. So we have so many people that are just locked into their devices all the time. And, and so this summer, what I did, man, it was cool. I had the same Bible. And I usually preach out of a new living translation. If you're looking for the, the translation or the NIV, the, the new international version. So if you want to buy one or two Bibles, um, I have like four or five different translations that I sit down and study with, physical Bibles. I preach out of this one. I got this new preaching Bible this summer and uh, I hadn't read it all yet, so I hadn't learned it all, but like, um, that was a joke. But my other Bible, I'd had it since I was a youth pastor. So I had it for like 15 years. And God spoke to me this summer. He said, hey, you need to start giving your preaching Bibles to your kids. And so I got to take my Bible. And listen, I mean, the binding was off, this whole thing. And I gave it to my oldest daughter. And I said, I want you to be able to see what I've wrestled with over the years. The things that I've studied, the things that I've highlighted, the things that I've written down. How many of you know you can't do that with phones? You trade those in every year anyway, some of you. They don't have money to do anything else. But anyways, like, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's something powerful and, and a lot of people don't even get your Bibles until you're gone. 
How many of you got like your grandpa's Bible, but you didn't get it until after he passed? Or why not pass down the word while you're still alive? So I told my other daughter, I said, I'm going to preach from this for about five years, and then I'm going to give you this one. And then I probably need to give one to my son pretty quick. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to challenge you. I want to see who's going to bring the challenge. I ain't giving you $50 every week, but you never know. Number two, build on God's heart. The Bible describes God as our heavenly father and our good shepherd. You ever thought about that? Especially the shepherd part, like we are correlated to sheep. You realize sheep are not smart animals? Anybody know that? Like they're not. Like you never see um, a sheep that's good with directions. There's no homing sheep. There's not, sheep aren't good at carrying stuff. There's no pack sheep. And sheep aren't good at protecting themselves. There's no attack sheep, right? In fact, Scripture says that we are all like sheep who have gone astray. And we need a good shepherd. The problem is, is that but how you grew up or whatever family system value you grew up in, that determines how you view the father. Can I tell you, me growing up, I didn't see God as a heavenly father. In fact, the only father figures I had in my life, when they did touch me, when I experienced the touch of a man, it was in abuse or it was in anger. I never had a man growing up that touched me in an affectionate way that showed me that he, that he was there to protect me. And so I can remember, and I'm just be, can I just be transparent this morning? Is that okay? I'm gonna be anyway. So like <laughs> the other night we were at a wedding and uh, like, I like to dance, I just do. I love hip hop music. I love a good party. I just do. When the DJ comes out, like, listen, it could get weird. All right. So I love it. Like, I just, I've always loved music. I've always loved. And I think some of it, like, I can remember when I was a kid, I was in first grade. And my stepfather came to pick me up from my babysitter. And of course, first grade, early 80s, like, breakdancing came on the scene. You know what I'm saying? So, like, music came on the radio. I'm over in my seat, you know, I'm like, you know, it's, I mean, I'm first grade. I'm like, I'm going to be a break dancer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, luckily God had other plans. Like, uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'll never forget without even a warning, I get a hand across the face and he was angry. And he said, you're white. You don't listen to that kind of music and I don't want to see you dancing to it. And that was the first time I really like felt the pain of racism, but also the time that I felt like this this man is not for me. He is against me. This is not, there is no love here. This is, I'm in a competition with somebody else in this house. And that's how I grew up. And can I tell you, that's kind of how I viewed God for a long time. It was just a competition of who's gonna, whose will is going to break first. And the only thing God existed for was to get me out of a mess when I needed him to or, to, or to, to punish me when I messed up. But you know what was powerful, Bill? I can remember at 18 years old, because I never thought God saw me. I thought God always just saw what I did. Because I thought, God, if you saw me, I wouldn't be in this mess. But it was at 18 years old when I poured my heart out on an altar in a little bitty church in in, in Southern Kentucky that I I realized, man, the Father sees me. Pastor Allen just celebrated his 70th birthday. That's why the ambulance is (laughs) coming. Y'all pay attention. <laughs> but I told him, I, listen, I tell him, uh, my, I used to call my dad, when we started restoring my relationship, I used to call him Pops. And so I tell him, he's my spiritual papa. And you are, you're my spiritual papa. Because let me tell you something, here's what I know about the hand of God and, and about the, the good shepherd, is that no matter what you've experienced in your life, when you surrender to the will of God, he starts placing spiritual shepherds in your life. And I've seen more good come from the men in my life than I've seen evil. And some of us gotta trust that God's heart is for you, not against you. I told my kids this summer, we were driving and I just stopped. I, I just, we were at a red light. I turned the music off and I said, listen, I wanna, I wanna tell you guys something. Cause you know, I got a teenager and I got one who's gonna be a teenager soon. And 
I know how it gets when you become teenagers. All of a sudden, you, you become inwardly, you, you just shut down. You don't talk to people. You think you, you can't talk to your parents. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the enemy off before we even get there. And I said, listen, I want you to know something. One of the greatest joys I have is being your father. And I said, I want you to know something. I don't care if it's little. I don't care if, it, I don't, I don't care if you think it's silly. If you ever have something you need to come talk to me about, I don't want you to even think about how I'm gonna respond. I want you to know I can't wait to hear about it. I said this because when you don't come to me with your fears, your worries, your insecurities, you rob me of the greatest blessing that I have on this earth and that's being your father. And can I tell you, when you don't trust God's heart, you rob him of the greatest joy he has and that's being your heavenly father. Don't rob him of that joy. Number three, you gotta build on with God's hands. You gotta trust God's hand. And this is all about trusting that God's gonna bless you in your resources and in your money. Not in a way of making you wealthy and rich. Can I tell you what the blessing of God really is? Three things, mercy, peace, and love. That's the blessing of God. That's why in Psalm 23, when he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's understanding that no matter what situation I'm in, if I have God's mercy and I have his peace and I have his love, let me tell you something, that's gonna overcome anything we experience in our life. We, we, we have, ever since God taught us how to be good stewards of our finances, let me tell you something, we've become so generous. We become more and more generous every year and we cannot outgive God. We've tried and we cannot do it. I used to, I've told you guys stories about how we'll be in town and like we'll pay for people's meals. We get our meal paid for and sometimes like twice in a week. I'm like, if I do it once, God does it twice. I'm like, I can't do it. I went all the way to Orlando, guys, and Cracker Barrel this summer and we're getting ready to leave. And the waitress goes, I can't explain it. I don't know who did it. Somebody paid for your meal. I'm like, come on, because surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the way to Orlando. Come on, somebody. I said, look at God. I'm telling you, it's this moment. Some of you don't do it God's way. And let me tell you something. When you don't do it God's way with your finances, you ever tried to paddle up creek against a current? It's almost impossible and it's a lot of hard work. When you do it God's way and you become good stewards and you become generous, can we tell you something? It's like you ain't gotta do nothing because you're flowing with the current now. And what I want my kids to, to understand is that I want them to have an advantage in life. And you know what that advantage is? It's not money, it's not fame, it's not any of that stuff. I want them to have the blessing of God in their life. Because when they have the blessing of God in their life, they have an advantage over everybody else. I don't care how wealthy their, their schoolmates are or anybody else, they got an advantage. Not because we got stuff, but because we got Jesus on our side. Last but not least, build on God's church. Build on God's church. It's keeping your family rooted and involved in the local church, a value of yours. Think about it. Don't answer it. Think about it. Is it really a value of yours? Where you say, man, I want them to be rooted in the house of God. They don't have to be here. We tell our guest services team, we say, listen, if we have VIPs and they're not really sold on our church, give them three other churches to go visit. Tell them we, we personally recommend them. I said, you need to know them. I said, because we, we want to recommend a good church if, if this is not the place that they're gonna settle for. We had a couple visit from Gallatin one time. They had just moved to Gallatin. We said, we know so-and-so, I work with them. They invited me to this church here, they came. I said, I said, you guys live in Gallatin? They said, yeah. I said, hey, I got some pastor friends there. They got a church. I said, go check them out before you come back to us. I said, because I know the burden that it can be to drive 30 minutes. And they looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, right, did you just invite me to another person's church? <laughs> like, you're the pastor because I want people to know that what we're building here is not something that's, that's ours. This is, God entrusted us with this. It's his church. Does the, being connected to the local church, is it a value to you and your family? Can I tell you what it did for my kids this summer? Man, we got to like July, the first of July, and my kids were literally like crying because we weren't coming to our church. Like you're talking about feeling convicted as a pastor. It's like, 
but we're, we're, we're on sabbatical, you know? And they're like, they were broken. One of my daughters was having nightmares that she lost all of her friends. And I'm like, what's, but you know what it also made me do in the moment? Made me be grateful for the community of believers we have in our lives. They were so pumped to get back today. They've been pumped to get back. And I thought that's what we set out to do. Because I remember when we started this church, I told my wife, I'm like, I don't want our kids growing up being the prototypical pastor's kids where they grew up hating church, being disenfranchised with their mom and dad and just hating it all together. And I thank God that they love their church. My oldest was five when we started the church. Maya was two, true, it wasn't even thought of at the time. And it's amazing to watch their faith grow, to watch their passion grow. And I thought, God, if they do nothing else, this is why we do what we do. Because they love their church. They love the relationships they've built. We went to, we got to go visit Elevation this summer. Um, and it was cool because when we got there, we were there for Youth X, which is like their youth camp. And so we got to experience a night with that. My daughter got to go to that and we were there and we walked in. We walked into the Matthews campus and um, almost 10 years ago to the day, me and about 12 or 13 others walked into that same campus. Andy, Andy Biggs was there. And uh, we walked in, met some of the staff. And Andy, you can probably remember, we were just like in awe of such a big vision that had come to fruition in a community. And we said, man, this, this could be us one day, you know? And I kid you not, we walk in and worship's going on and there's all these students up front and my daughter's crying. And she goes, she turns to me, I, I, I can't make this up. She turns to me and says, dad, this can be us one day. I mean, it was a full circle moment, Gaines, that reminded me the power of the local church and the impact it can make in our kids' lives. I used to ask the question, if this church went away, would our community weep or would they even know about it? Let me ask you this question. If you stopped being connected here, would your kids notice or would they weep? Because some of them wouldn't even bat an eye. You know why? Because it's not communicated as a value in the home. At some point, you have to wrestle with, are we intentionally passing down values that will outlive us or are they gonna figure it out for themselves? Where are they going? Can I tell you, here's the deal. Our values are revealed when the rain comes. When crisis, chaos, tension arises, you find out what, where your house is built on. When all hell breaks loose, See Vonda down here up front. And she's a living testimony to this. You know, I saw somebody this morning as I walked down the aisle. And if anybody would have had an excuse to say, like, man. I'm not going to church. I'm so mad at God on this. And she might have all those emotions, but you know what I saw from this woman who's battling cancer? Hands lifted up and worship. I walked up and I said, man, she's a living testimony to my sermon this morning. Because her foundation is built on something else. telling you, church, Jesus said there's only one thing in his word that he said he would build, and that's his church. I don't know about you, but if that's the only thing he's focused on building, I don't want God to help me build what I want to build. I want to be a part of what he's building. 
And that's changing lives, it's impacting families. It's seeing family trees resurrected. And he says, upon this rock, that rock was not Peter himself, but it was on the words that Peter proclaimed. And he proclaimed, you are the Messiah, the son of God. And some of you have to establish that foundation. Is he savior of your life? Is he the Lord of all your life? Because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And it's saying, I want to build my life on him. Because here's the challenge, be a wise builder so that when the rain comes, you'll experience God's blessing. Well, I hope this message has inspired you, that it's encouraged you, and that you're ready to take a next step of some kind. We've got some links in the description of this video uh, with some ideas of maybe what's next for you. Uh, the way that we can just connect with you and help walk you through what uh, your next step might be in your walk with Jesus. Uh, if you have questions, this is a great way for us to connect and maybe help you uh, understand some answers to those things as well. Uh, don't forget that if maybe you would like to support the ministry of Generation Church, that link will be in the description as well as we can give back to see God move this mission and this vision forward even beyond anything we could ever think or imagine. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time.